Hello everyone, welcome to Wall Street for Main Street Podcast. My name is Mo Darouge and today's spe- special guest is Michael Covell. He is an entrepreneur and author of five books, including the international bestseller, Trend Following, How to Make Millions in Up or Down Market, and also The C- Complete Turtle Trader, How 21 Novice Investors Became Overnight Millionaires. He is also known for his popular podcast, Trend Following, which you can check out on iTunes. Michael, thank you for joining me. Thank you. And for, for our listeners out there that never heard of you, uh, I want to start off by talking about your background. I do that with all my guests uh, so people can uh, learn about where they came from and how to, they became so successful. So maybe they could learn a thing or two. So I want to talk about your background. How did you become in, interested in investing and how did you discover trend trading? I was a political science major. I went to George Mason University. Uh, I had terrible grades, so I decided to go to graduate school to maybe make my grades look better. Uh, after two years of grad school, I got my MBA from Florida State. I decided, well, I'm going to work on Wall Street. And I tried to figure out everything I possibly could about who was really making money. And just through some serendipity, I stumbled into a magazine article almost 20 years ago. And that article talked about trend trading. And here I was reading about Warren Buffett and margin of safety and Seth Klarman and all these great fundamental investors. And here was this other group of people that didn't care what the fundamentals were, did not care what the news said, didn't care about what was going on in the economy. But if a market, any market was going up, they wanted a long position. And if a market was going down, they wanted a short position. Of course, they had rules on when to get in and when to get out. But that was the idea. So they were agnostic to all the fundamentals that keep us still to this day so enraptured. And that just fascinated me. And and one thing led to another. I knocked on doors. I I found my way in. I put a website up that led to books, that led to a film. Uh, And a few years ago, I decided to start a podcast. And the podcast is actually much more diverse than the trading these days. That I still cover the trading, but I've had multiple Nobel Prize winners on, many uh, the top behavioral minds in the world, many top economists, usually of the libertarian bent, for sure. Um, and that's kind of where I'm at today. And I happen to be in Asia right now because a few years back, I took a speaking tour of Asia, liked it a lot, and decided to continue to spend the vast majority of my time in Asia, at least for right now. And that's one thing I find interesting about people that are successful investors, that they uh, come from a background where they didn't uh, go to school to learn about investing or finance, but they had a major in other, they uh, major in other, uh, I'm sorry, they got a degree in other majors, and then after they graduated, they end up becoming very successful investors or traders, just like you. Now, it just shows you that you don't have to go to school uh, to become a successful investor. Yeah, there's, there's nothing there's nothing except a few obscure college professors and a few obscure papers. Absolutely nothing I talk about in my books about this style of trading called trend following can be found in a college classroom. Absolutely nothing. It does not exist. The universities and the teachers and the curriculum, they don't they don't know. They don't understand. They teach the standard issue uh, teachings, which is. Uh, You know, just buy and hold and the world's going to be okay, and trust the system. And when you wake up one day and there's a 30 or 40 or 50 percent crash, uh, never mind that. Just hold on and it'll all come back. And even if you have to wait 30 years, so what? So it's it's uh, that's not my world. So why did you decide to uh, go with trend following uh, trend trading rather than value investing or fundamental investing like what Warren Buffett did or Benjamin Graham with margin of safety. What, 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 what was it about trend, uh, trend trading that you liked the most? Number one was the performance. Uh, you start to see these performance numbers that were just huge. And then you could see decades of professional proof, you know, people that had come long before me. So this would be like in the trend following world. These are the Warren Buffett's in the trend following world, and they, and they exist. I mean, there's people in the trend following world with 40 years of audited track records. And so that just, that fascinated me to, to look at the, the big performance. I think number two, what I started to pick up on too, which is, is these events like the NASDAQ crash in 2000 or the crisis in 08, 09. 
I mean, if we really look at the crisis of 08 and 09, if Goldman Sachs, a private company, a bank, an investment bank, simply existing, basically a hedge fund, if Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley weren't bailed out, would Warren Buffett be still standing? And that's, a, that's an operative question to be asking because it's getting glossed over. But that was a pretty big event. And so, you know, I, I, I still to this day, I'd rather be on the side of a style of trading that's not trying to predict these particular events. And a partic- predicting an event could be like predicting, will Goldman Sachs be bailed out and continue to exist? I mean, how would anyone know that? Because normally in the, the normal rules of capitalism, Goldman Sachs would not be in business today. And if they weren't in business, would Warren Buffett be in business? I mean, so the, these, are, these are the things on the fundamental side where I think there's a lot of misinformation and frankly, a lot of mythology. Now, today in 2015, no one's really talking about what took place in the halls of Congress and the Fed six, seven, eight years ago. But I think there's some strong arguments to be made that the course of America changed. And maybe for most people that just have mutual funds today, they don't feel like that change has happened. But one of the things that I like about trend following is it puts yourself in a position that when the unexpected surprise happens, you can benefit. And I think anybody looking at the last six, seven, eight years and just saying, wow, how did we go from being so far down in March of 09 to so far up today? Well, you know, no, until you cash out, you don't have those profits. And I just think there's, I mean, it, it's kind of a, I'm giving it a, a kind of a holistic thinking here, kind of almost like a brain dump. But there's many factors that go into why I like trend following and perhaps why some of the investing myths that you brought up. Warren Buffett is one of the most successful investors ever. He deserves high praise, but I think he's also open for criticism. Yeah, I I think he's a crony capitalist. He's a great investor, but he's definitely a a big-time crony. I mean, he he was instrumental in in getting the uh, bailout for the banks. Yeah, I mean, and that's that's not – I mean, at that stage of the game, that's not – you know, capitalism with the same rules for everybody. You're right. That's that's a crony capitalistic move. And, you know, whether it's corporate welfare or social welfare, all forms of welfare where, you know, some group is using the governmental system to get their benefits. Uh, and, and frankly, I think we've created a situation in America where one guy, you know, you could have two guys in a suburban neighborhood living next door to each other. And one works for the government with benefits out the wazoo and the other guy has lost his job or doesn't have a great source of income. And that guy's actually paying for all the benefits that the other guy has. It's a really crazy system we have right now. Uh, it's, it's definitely not what we talk about in schools in terms of opportunity and capitalism. Uh, the real world is quite different. And right. And we'll talk about trend trading uh, a little bit more later on the podcast, but I want to get your thoughts and insight on what's going on in the economy right now. Even though you you trade, you still follow the economy. I can tell by uh, on Facebook. We're, we're Facebook fans. I can tell you on the post that you still follow the economy. I want to start talking about Greece and their big debt problem. Uh, do you find it ironic that pundits are talking about the Greece debt problem when the U.S. has the exact same problem as Greece, maybe even worse, with the unsustainable amount of debt and a dying currency? Well, I mean, you know, if we just were being factual about the U.S. dollar right now, it's been going up for a while. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, so uh, I, and I think you, that draws a distinction between America and Greece is that America can create currency and Greece put themselves in a situation to where they don't have uh, they really don't have sovereignty anymore. I mean, they're just a, a, a slave state to the European Union. And that's going to be interesting to see how that, I mean, many of the people that I know in the trading world have long said that they fully expect the euro as a currency to eventually disappear. Uh, They're doing a pretty good job of holding it together right now. I think your comment about the parallels, look, you can't have a situation where a country like America has a massive credit card bill, uh, does not have personal responsibility. Everyone expects the government to pay for something. Of, you know, to give them some benefit, and it never stops. You know, if the U.S. stock market was not at all-time highs today, I tend to think that the, the, the magic salve that keeps everybody happy, which is this wealth effect, this idea that my 
my mutual funds look strong. I don't think I think there'd be quite a quite an uproar in America. I mean, if, if the if the if the S and P was cut in half today, I don't think people would be as just sitting back, satiated, and just fat and happy, so to speak. I think there'd be a little bit of an uproar. I don't necessarily know how how that would unfold, uh, but I think there'd be an uproar. Yeah, the government had done a good job of trying to keep the uh, American happy by what, by what you said, the wealth effect, by inflating the stock market and other assets as well. But if you look between the number, the economy in this country is not doing very well. If, if you look at the real unemployment numbers and, and the growth and look at the uh, a whole bunch of other statistics on the economy, overall, the economy is, hasn't improved since the 2008 financial crisis. You know, I, I'd make an argument that one of the biggest ways, and people might think I'm crazy for saying this, but one of the best indicators in my mind about the growth of the American economy is the growth of the American human being, the physical growth and size. I mean, if you have this many people in a country that are severely overweight, I mean, it says something about personal responsibility. It says something about laziness. And if we've lost this ethic, if we've lost this drive, this entrepreneurial drive, how the hell can there be expected to be anything really positive happening other than, for, you know, as you mentioned, the government uh, taking certain steps to keep people happy? Oh, yeah, I agree. You are what you eat, right? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to go off on a tangent or anything in terms of that, but I think it's, you know, sometimes we get caught up in talking about these big picture macro issues, but I think if you look on the ground and you look at the American individual, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of, you could almost draw a caricature of a lost person. And I'm not talking, look, there's plenty of people that are not lost. I mean, there's plenty of people that still understand reason. They understand liberty. I'm sure many of them listen to your podcast, but I, I think that's a minority. Oh, yeah, I agree. But especially in this area, Northern Virginia, where we have majority uh, Republicans or Democrats who are look for the government for answers, and yet the government seems to make things worse rather than solve the problem. And if you look at the candidate for the 2016 election, I mean, most of the candidates don't have good solution to the problem, except for maybe Rand Paul. I mean, if you look at uh, Bernie Sa uh, Sanders, who's complaining about how we have 23 different deodorant and yet we can't feed uh, the poor. And uh, that, that kind of statement right there is why a person like him doesn't understand how the economy works and how the free market works and how capitalism can is the cure for poverty. I mean, it's not a perfect system. It's not going to get completely get rid of poverty, but it's the best system out there for uh, reducing poverty. You know, I would make the, I would make the argument too on elections, and this might be controversial to some, but I think American elections and the desire for Americans, and I'm one of them, to believe that the next election is going to solve the next thing, the next problem. That that right there is the biggest magic trick, illusion, scam that there is in 2015. Absolutely, 100 percent. The idea that you will vote in an election in America and something will become, quote, better. It's it's just it's too big of a country. There's too many crony capitalists. There's too many hands in the cookie jar in Congress. It is, for all intents and purposes, except for a very few number of politicians, it's a one party government. The differences are without distinction when you really get down to it, because all of those people in Congress every last one of them, do not exist to do something good, in my humble opinion. They exist for the primary reason, the primary reason, the number one reason that someone goes to Congress or someone wants to become president has absolutely nothing to do in 2015 with moving America forward. It has to do with personal ego. It has to do with their desire to sit in a chair and lord over people to control people, and to manipulate people. It has nothing, and that right there, if the American public can really grasp that the system is entirely broken, the next candidate and the next election is not going to solve it, then you can start to take steps in your life and say, how can I truly find Galt's Gulch? Because it's not here. 
Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. I mean, I was looking at uh, Hillary Clinton campaign promises, and it's nothing special, uh, nothing, nothing out of the ordinary about her promises. I've seen that shit for the past 20 years from other candidates talking about increasing public investment, which is a fancy word for you know increasing spending on stuff we don't need, uh, cutting taxes for the middle class. Uh, increasing taxes for the wealthy and you know stuff like that, but you know they don't deliver on those promises. They just make things worse. I mean, they do deliver on spending. They they love to spend, and they're definitely going to continue to spend. Um, and yeah, none of these candidates also they don't have any solution to the debt problem or the spending problem that the government has. What if, what if the debt problem is not a problem for the vast majority of Americans? What if the vast majority of Americans are so lost, have drank so much Kool Aid? And like the benefits, and the benefits only come from debt, I just don't think people care. What they care about is are they getting a check from the government? And if they're getting their check, you know, it's like they wake up each day. You wake up each day and you say, hold on, am I still in the matrix? Is my feeding tube still in my rear end? And if it's still <laughs> in my rear end and I'm still getting my nutrients, I'm happy. So I, I think, you know, conceptually, the idea that any politician talking about anything, I mean, these politicians are just representative of. Uh, the desires and needs and wants of the American public. And those desires and needs and wants, they're not the same things I want anymore. I mean, the vast majority of Americans want something different than I do. And, and that's a great point. So I want to get, what's your outlook for the economy uh, for the next few years? Do you think the economy is, is primed for another crash like we had in 2008? Or do you think the government will be able to kick the can down the road for a couple more years? Let me put this into a trend following type answer. So in trend following, I really don't have a good prediction. I can't tell you what's going to happen. I mean, we can look at the economy and we can say, wow, things don't feel right. The numbers don't look right. But when it comes to stock markets and commodity markets, trying to predict those things is very difficult. Right. However, however, it's pretty easy to look at all the major markets and see boom bust periods, bubble periods in all markets. And this is this happens with regularity. So I think if somebody is sitting around and they're they're feeling happy about their mutual fund positions, you're like, oh, my gosh, the S&P is at all time highs. Look at my account. It's so much higher than it was in 2009. I'm so happy. I'm so happy. Well, you really need to imagine and say to yourself, is it possible that my S&P mutual fund could drop by 50 or 60 percent? Is that possible? And is it possible that it could drop 50 or 60 percent and stay down for 15 years, which would then put us all the way back to the late 90s and looking at maybe a, a 30 or 40 year period of stocks being flat in America? Look, we don't all live forever. 30 or 40 years of stocks being flat. I mean, that's not going to be any extra income coming in. So I guess the, you know, the answer is I can't tell you what's going to happen tomorrow. But we all know that when these types of actions are taken by governments and when people demand more and more benefits and when you can look and say, my gosh, what happened to interest rates? We used to I look, I still remember my CPA told me in the late 90s when I was starting my business. He said, Michael, just put two million dollars in the bank free and clear after taxes. You'll make one hundred and twenty thousand dollars a year, you know, six percent interest. Huh. I mean, Right now, think about the notion, and so many of your listeners, there is never going to be interest income again. Where is there any evidence that you're ever going to see interest income again? And then you need to say to yourself, if there's not going to be interest income, and they've taken the interest income away, why have they taken the interest income away? Like, why in 2015, when you hear all the politicians talk about how great the economy is, why is there no interest income? What, what the hell is going on? There's no interest income because everybody knows that if interest rates went back to three or four or five percent, guess where the S&P would be? Not at all time highs. So I, I think to, to answer your question is I can't tell you what's going to happen tomorrow, but everybody can look at what's happening today and realize that we've put ourselves in a position that's tenuous. And if something is tenuous, especially in the markets, it eventually pops. So let, let's talk about trend trading for people that never heard of it or want to learn about it. Give us a trend trading one-on-one. So let's start off by uh, talking about what is trend trading. Well, one way to look at it is say, okay, 
if the S&P went from where it was in March of 2009 till today, so roughly what, seven, six, seven, eight hundred to about 2100, right. you know, if you just look at that on a chart and say to yourself, I don't know anything about politics, I don't know anything about economics, uh, I don't know anything about the markets. But if I went long, if I bought the S&P, you know, in March of 2009, you know, and you just kind of held on to it, you can see that you didn't have to know anything to make money in that particular market. The same thing, you could look at Apple or Netflix. So it's pretty easy to see that if you just think about markets trending and saying to yourself, I don't have to know anything about them, but I want to get on board. It's a famous you know, axiom. I mean, let your, let your profits run and cut, cut your losses short. I mean, this is an extremely famous uh, axiom from, uh, <clears throat> you know, from, from stock trading. So trend trading attempts to get onto a trend, ride that trend as long as the trend goes up. And then when the trend reverses, you can't get out the top. You know, nobody can predict the bottom. No one can predict the top. But when the trend reverses, you get out on the, on the other side as it's coming down. And so a trend trader, if you think about, you know, think about the NASDAQ in the late 90s, it went well up and then it went way down. Well, you didn't get in exactly at the bottom. You didn't get out exactly at the top. So you, you got in late and you got out late. And what you did is you captured the middle part of that trend. How is this uh, executed? Uh, the long story short is a very simple, what I would call technical indicators, things like moving averages. Now, this whole discussion can get very in-depth. Obviously, I've, I've written five books on this subject. But what's great about it is that even though you and I can have our strong opinions about economics and fundamentals and politicians, none of that matters to a trend-following trader because the only thing you care about is the stock price, the market price. And if you're following that, you make your decisions off that alone. It's not unlike the same type of thinking that would have gone into the MIT blackjack team. You're trying to find an edge, you bet on the edge, and then you just keep repeating this process. And you literally can be on a desert island and have no knowledge of what's going on politically, economically, or in the markets and make a fortune. So for people that want to... Uh do trading. Uh, a lot of people ask me, um, do you have to have a certain skill or certain personality to be a trader or is it is something that anybody can master? You know, the reason I got into this subject is because I came across a story and it was a very famous story of teaching people how to become trend following traders. And the story went something like this. There was a guy in 1976, he made his first million dollars in the pits in Chicago. By the early 1980s, he had made $200 million, which is billions in today's terms. He went to see the old Trading Places movie with uh, Eddie Murphy and Dan Aykroyd, with his partner. And they walked out. And, you know, look, this, this movie was about taking Eddie Murphy off the street and kind of making him rich and successful. And so this guy, Rich Dennis, who had made all this money by the age of 37, looked at his partner and said, you know what? We can teach people to do what we do. And his partner said, what are you talking about? You're savant. You're brilliant. They, I mean, what do you have to, you're like the best trader in the world. They made a bet, <clears throat> influenced by this movie. They, they put one ads in like Wall Street Journal and they hired uh, 20 trainees. Uh, these were people that were uh, some like 19 into their early 20s, many with no experience, uh, not great job backgrounds. Uh, some had uh, interesting backgrounds. They were chess players. One guy wrote manuals for Dungeons and Dragons. Anyways, long story short, they gave them a set of rules, these 20 students, uh, over two weeks. They said, hey, here are the rules. Go trade them. Follow these rules or you're fired. And these were these trend-following rules. Four years later, the group of 20 had made about $100 million profit. So it was this classic story of nurture trumping nature, uh, 25 years later, many of those traders are still trading for clients today as hedge funds. So it's just a fantastic story. They were nicknamed the Turtles because this famous trader wanted to grow traders like he had seen turtles being grown in a Singapore turtle breeding farm. So, you know, the idea, that's kind of a long answer, but the idea, can anyone do it? Well, you know, I, I, wrote, I wrote one book about just this very issue. Can anyone do it? And the answer is yes. So for trend trading, is it like day traders where they have to sit in front of the computer and look at the charts all day and, and 
buy and sell. What's the difference between uh, trend trading and other type of uh, day trading? Yeah, trend trading, uh, trend trading is definitely not day trading. So you're not going to be sitting in front of a screen. In fact, many trend traders today will trade off uh, weekly closing prices. So imagine, you know, people, a lot of people sit around and look at the S&P all day long and stare at a screen and they're looking at who knows how many price points in a given trading day. Well, you could also just say, I'm not going to do any day trading. I'm going to trade the daily closing price, or you could go even longer out and say, I'm going to trade the weekly closing price. So that's another interesting aspect of trend following is that you're getting away from the noise. You're getting away from the, you know, the day-to-day news media and all that stuff. And I mean, let's face it, who in their right mind really wants to listen to anybody in the news media? I mean, these are people that are trained puppets, trained sock puppets, trained seals, reading a teleprompter all day long, trying to make it seem like they know something, and they don't know a damn thing. (laughs) Yeah, I I don't watch CNBC or Fox Business or Bloomberg, unless they have uh, Jim Rogers or Marsh Farber come on and talk about the economy. Other than that, I I don't don't listen to those guys. They they talk too fast, and it's, it's like... Yeah. It's hard to follow. You got to go out. You know, I went out to Chiang Mai, Thailand, and talked to Mark at at his place. He's uh, really uh, is the second time I had a chance to meet him. The first time I met him at his place in Thailand. That's uh, that's worthy of a trip in uh, in Asia. Oh yeah, we yeah I I talked to Mark a few times. We did a podcast with him. He, he's a great guy. We love talking to him. Him and and Jim Rogers. Yeah. So for the trend trading, how popular has it has it become in the past uh, few years? Has it exploded ever since the 2008 financial crisis, or has it steadily become more popular in the, in the past decade or so? Yeah, you know, that's a good question. I don't know exact numbers. I would say it's still a minority strategy because, look, when you have zero interest rates and you have the U.S. stock market at all-time highs, regardless of how it got there, you know, people are saying, well, this is fine for me. I mean, this is this is great. I mean, and, and I think one way to think about that, too, is that if, if the stock market you know, triples from 09 till today and people, they don't feel the need to look at any other type of thinking uh, until until they wake up one day and another one of those 50 percent corrections hits and then they're sitting ahead somewhere, let's say, you know, it could be a few years in the future and they're looking back and they're going, oh, hold on. The stock market went up from March of 09, six, seven, eight hundred to 2100. And then in 2017, it went back to 1100 or 1200. Oh, wow. That's that's a kind of up and down type situation spread out over nearly a decade. It didn't really work out how I thought it was going to work out. And so I think that's that's one thing people should really keep in mind about uh, about buy and hold mutual funds. There, it's not a panacea. It generally, unless one lives forever, and none of us live forever, it's it's a strategy that's uh, fraught with peril, to say the least. Yeah, bu- uh, buying and holding mutual fund is an idea that uh, they say it's the easiest way to become a millionaire, but I don't think that's true because. It, there's a lot of boom and bust in the market, plus the fee that they rank, that the uh, manager, the money manager, take in from those mutual funds. It, the fees are that's a lot of money that they're uh, giving up to the money managers. So I don't recommend mutual fund. Index fund is not bad, um, but mutual fund I stay away from. But Michael, thank you for joining me for a podcast. If people want to find out more about your work, where can they go? Best place is trendfollowing.com. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Michael, and and please come back on again. Absolutely. Thank you.